I think we've now um, resolved things in the other video room, so I think we are now good to go here. Okay. All right. Um, um, as you can see from the title, um, we are sort of welcoming Bertram Lotzber and Silbaka Kwachani from the, uh, let me get this, the title right, from the Instrumentation and Information Technology Department at Etemba Labs. And they will be telling us about Dolose, a distributed physics data acquisition system. Take it away, please. All right. Thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So uh, I am Sesabaka Koboshiani, and uh, I'm with my colleague, Petram Losper. Uh, we are going to give you a duet where we'll walk you through a bit about uh, the distributed data acquisition system that we're currently building. And it's so eloquently named DOLOS. So uh, I will just quickly uh, stop sharing my webcam because there's nothing much to, to see really. Um, it was just for everyone to see that we are real and not bots. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm having an issue going to the next slide. Okay, I'll just use the arrows there. Okay, so just a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we'll just walk you through basically who we are and what it is that we do uh, before I briefly walk you through uh, basic concepts and techniques in triggering and data acquisition. And then I'll hand you over to Bertram, who will tell you all about this uh, exciting data acquisition system we're building. Uh, I think also acknowledgements are in order. Uh, so the bulk of the material that we'll be sharing, as well as ideas, uh, some of them have been borrowed from our collaborators. So the likes of Stan Paluskas, who's our collaborator on the Dolos project itself, and then we have uh, particular uh, accelerator physicists that we have on our facility that shared a bit of insight into how our accelerators work. So the likes of Joel Mira and Fumulani Nemulodi, as well as on trigger and data acquisition, we, we took some ideas and material from Andrea Negri, uh, uh, from some of his slides that he was presenting to the ISOT that uh, summer schools, I think, organized by CERN. Okay. So who are we? Um, we work for an organization called Itemba Labs or Itemba Laboratory for Accelerator-Based Sciences, uh, which has uh, operational sites in Cape Town and Johannesburg. So our biggest uh, site is right here in Foray, which has about 70% of our particular accelerators. And then we have a satellite site in Joburg, just net, next to the VETS campus. And so we are a, a multidisciplinary research facility, and we are a business unit of the National Research Foundation. We specialize in basic and applied uh, sciences in, in accelerator physics, uh, nuclear physics, materials research, as well as production of radio pharmaceuticals and radiochemicals for local and international markets. But probably most importantly, we are in the business of training and developing young researchers uh, and students basically in this fields of uh, nuclear physics and accelerator science and engineering. And all of this is made possible by uh, our more than four accelerators that we have on site. We are actually in the process of procuring another cyclotron, which will be dedicated just to the production of radio pharmaceuticals and radiochemicals. Okay, I need to remember to click on that to move to the next slide. Okay, so these are some of our real estate that we have on site. To the top right there, you will see the, the biggest of the machines we have. That's our separated sector cyclotron. Um, this is quite an old machine. I think a year or so or two ago, we were celebrating its 30th uh, birthday. 
So it requires pre-accelerated beams from uh, one of the two injector cyclotrons that we have to the left. So these guys can generate beams up to eight mega electron volts. So these are pre-accelerated beams that are then directed to the cyclotron, which will then ramp them up to energies that are required either for production of radio pharmaceuticals or for experimental purposes. To the bottom row, we have um, other accelerators. So we have a tandetron to the left. This we use for our, our ion beam analysis techniques right here in Cape Town. It can generate beams up to six mega electron volts. Uh, and then to the right is the tandem accelerated mass spectrometer that that's uh, housed in our satellite facility in Johannesburg. And this can generate beams up to 12 mega electron volts. And then we have a dedicated accelerator that just produces um, radio pharmaceuticals to our local markets. And this cyclotron produces fluorine 18 isotopes that are then sent to local hospitals. Uh, they have a very short half-life of about two hours or so. Um, and like I said, we are in the process of procuring another machine, a 70 MeV cyclotron that will also be used to generate uh, more, I think it's alpha emitting radio pharmaceuticals like S13211 and so forth. So once uh, the beam has then been accelerated to the energies that we want uh, from the SSC, it will then be directed to our experimental volts, which we have there as physics volts. And this is where the bombardment happens with some target materials and then the signals are acquired by our data acquisition systems, which is where we come in. So to the top left there, you can just see some of our front end electronics for our magnetic spectrometer. Uh, like I said, we're a research facility, so everything is well neatly arranged, as you can see. To the bottom, it's just a snapshot of the beam line, also for the magnetic spectrometer. What you can see there are quadruple magnets who, uh, they are in triplets, so they generally work in triplets or doubles to focus the beam. Um, in this case, the, the ones, the two to the edges, basically work on one axis while the middle one works on uh, the other axis perpendicular to the other two. And it's normally of uh, double uh, the energy or double the strength of the other two. And then down stream there it's probably not so visible but there is a a target assembly so this is where we would have targets of different materials that are then brought in and out of the beam path and this is where the interaction happens and so now that you have seen uh, the equipment that we have so just a bit of an introduction really to triggering and data acquisition in the nuclear physics space. Um, so the main purpose really of a DAQ or a data acquisition system is to process the signals that are generated in, in your detector and then save whatever information is of interest onto some permanent storage for offline analysis. Okay, so you normally have a component which we call the trigger so the purpose of this guy is to determine if the signals you're getting from the detector are interesting and whether the deck should then start acquiring them, uh, process, filter them, and then send them off to storage where they can be analyzed. Uh, maybe reconstruction uh, processes are also done. And then uh, researchers can either publish their material, which as an organization, that's really the KPA that we are being monitored and uh, evaluated on, the number of students that we train, as well as publications that we, we make. Also, there is a, a design feedback that can be fed either to the design of the vaults or the detectors. Uh, so this comes normally from simulations, Fluka or GNT simulations that our researchers would do. And then the data that's generated can be analyzed and probably fed back into optimizing our designs and so forth. So uh, I think it's worth noting that this field is really an alchemy of uh, multiple disciplines. So 
not just physics, but there is need to know some basic electronics, some networking, as well as computer science, just so as to, to make things work. Okay, so like I said, the main purpose of the trigger logic is really you are the decision making uh, a module that will then direct the deck and tell it to start acquiring the data. And so it needs to operate with some minimal and controlled latency. So it needs to be deterministic. What we normally do is we will feed signals from the detector into the trigger, as well as the same signals are fed into the deck but with some delay in between to give uh, the, the trigger some time to make its decision. And then if it triggers that the data is of interest, then the deck would start doing its acquisition. And what the deck does, it's just to do the readout. At the same time, it's responsible for the data flow. So after reading out the data from the front end electronics, we will collect the data, build events, maybe some filtering might need to happen, and then logging the data. It also has the responsibility of giving this overarching run control and configuration, as well as monitoring process to the entire operations. And so, yeah, this is normally the architectural design that we would then have. All your detector channels go into the front end electronics and the trigger as well. I mean, you can think of a trigger, it can be as simple as a periodic trigger, like a timer. So every one second or so, your front end electronics will start acquiring data. But in the physics world, since uh, the processes are stochastic and uh, basically uh, unpredictable, then there is a bit of some complexity that can be put into your trigger. We normally use simple things uh, like comparators, but it can be as complex as having an FPGA module with dedicated logic to, to determine if the physics is of interest. And then from the front end electronics, it goes through to your readout network for event building, processing, filtering, and finally to storage. And there's usually two ways that we, we manage our triggers, uh, either through interrupts generated by the hardware in your trigger logic, or polling and uh, polling is the one that we use mostly whereby the, the single bot controller would then keep on reading a specific module on the trigger and once it's told that there is something of interest then it, it, it starts acquiring the data. The problem with interrupts is that uh, there's a potential problem of undetermined latency depending on whatever the operating system is busy doing the interrupt might be delayed in some instances. And so once the trigger has generated uh, its decision, then the front end electronics would be read out. Uh, so they would then start by first doing their digitization, whether we convert from analog to digital. Um, we have ADCs, time to digital converters, uh, charge to digital converters for VME modules, for example. And we can speed up uh, our data read, readouts or the performance of the system in VME using direct memory transfer. And topologies that we usually contend with, it's the bus topology, for example, in the VME case, and as well as network topologies. Um, the bus is the simplest, but not so effective or efficient because now the, this bus is shared by all the, the, the modules or units connected to it. And so there are limitations, it's not easily scalable. There needs to be some arbitration to determine who has control of the bus and who can send and receive and so forth. Okay. And now once we have acquired or read out our data, then we need to build events before we can store them to storage. And what's probably most important is the framing of our events so that we can uh, tag each payload to know where the data came from, you know, from which detector sectors or detector channels, from which front end electronics and so forth. So that during our offline analysis, then it's easy to unpack the data and do the reconstruction. Uh, another concept that we make most use of is buffering. 
So, like I said, the, the physics processes are stochastic and you would find uh, your triggers are basically random. And that then has an effect on your, your deck rate. It's very much reduced because most of the time your system might be busy, uh, which we call dead time. It's, it's busy trying to process an event, so it has no time to process an incoming trigger. So the, the way to improve on this is to buffer. You can buffer your triggers. You can buffer basically all the way down the chain onto your deck system. Uh, similar concept, it's used in networking. And this optimizes the usage of your, of your up, output channels, uh, whether it's to disk or network. Uh, most that, of you that know about network theory, you would know that just increasing the size of the buffer is not necessarily the good thing because then it can make your system unresponsive. Um, sometimes it takes you much longer to discover that there are issues because you'd have to wait for your buffer occupancy to fill up. So it's a, a delicate trick that one needs to find the, the right balance. And yeah, like I said, in building our events, we need to have a way to tag the data so that we can identify the sources uh, or where the, all the data comes from. Uh, the other important thing about the event format is that it needs to be easily extendable. So if you add more detectors into your setup, you shouldn't have to go and change your event format, just extend it. And this is probably the most important or the core of your experiment because once you have captured or acquired the data, which is really an expensive process because to run the accelerator is not cheap at all. So you want that you do everything right until you have captured your data onto storage. And when you're doing your offline analysis, you want to be able to reconstruct the events as they happened. And that's where the event, event format comes to play. Uh, lastly, the other purpose of the deck is to do overall system control and monitoring. So you want to monitor all the different components of your deck from the trigger to the front end electronics to your event builder modules, etc. At the same time, you want to monitor your data so that as you're capturing it online, you can see whether there are some um, maybe mistakes in the setup and you can quickly correct those because uh, it might be too expensive to repeat the experiment. So as you will note then that the deck can be in different states at any given time. And so it is really a finite state machine that can either be uh, in a configured state or it could be running or it could be stopped. And it's the purpose of this run control and configuration module to ensure that the transitions occur smoothly and also to give the user this graphical user interface where they can control the deck. So I think with a bit of that history, then I will hand over to Bertram just to walk you through on this data acquisition system that we're busy building. Over to you, Bertram. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Bertram Losper. Today I'm going to have a discussion about what is the loss, what are the requirements for data acquisition. And then I'm going to go, go over the design and implementation of the loss data acquisition system. What are the requirements for data acquisition? It's basically just transmitting data from the physical phenomena that's being measured into storage. A data acquisition system should be reconfigurable depending on what experiment the researcher is running. It should be able to monitor the data flow from detector to storage. You should be able to monitor the front end electronics or the hardware. This can be achieved via, via feedback messages, so just to monitor the state of the deck. And experiments should be able to run for days, weeks, depending on how long the researcher is running the experiment. What is uh, the lost deck? The lost deck is basically a collaboration between Project Science and Itamba Labs. The main reason for developing the loss is to modernize the way we process physics data because in a lot of facilities, 
the install software that was written years ago by postdocs and students that are being modified or act for new experiments and comes into the facil facilities. The last stack that we are developing needs to be, or it's gonna be exten extensible, scalable, and so a robust stack that should be able to integrate multiple front end systems. We're gonna replace the way we store data, currently we store it in raw format, and our data analysis shouldn't limit concurrent operations. What uh, frameworks exist today which we can use to build a data acquisition system like this? After a couple of rounds of research, we have decided that these will be our main components of the, the last data acquisition, data acquisition system. We will use Apache Kafka for data acquisition. We use Python because it's the de facto programming language when it comes to data science or data analysis. And for visualization, we use Plotly um, within view. The reason behind using Apache Kafka is because Kafka is a messaging framework or streaming framework that allows us to manage communication between the sources. It allows for a multi-producer, multi-consumer model, multi-producers, and you can have multiple clients producing to multiple topics or a single topic and or multi-consumer as in multiple consumers can consume from the same topic without interfering with each other. And we can collect and analyze data in real time. Benefits of using Apache Kafka is because it's fault tolerant. We can input messages at 1 million. We can consume at 2 million messages per second. And because it's open source, there's a huge amount of community community support when it comes to Kafka. It could also be used as data storage. Um, yeah, sorry. It could be used as data storage. Uh, because it's so robust as a data storage system, we can guide consumers that, that doesn't have to work in real time. Using Kafka as our central messaging system, we can combine distinct data sources that's existing at the lab already. We can aggregate any other, any number of uh, auxiliary systems, for instance, slow control with the same timestamp put into Kafka, and we can scale our workload horizontally. The same with our consumers, we don't need monster analysis system because we can also scale horizontally we can develop consumers for visualization we can use create consumers for storing the raw data in parquet format that the researchers can take home and putting it all together we came up with this high level architecture drawing where we have our distinct data sources we have event builder, consumer producer, which builds the interesting physics event. We have a raw data spooler, which consumes raw data and store it in parquet format. We have a data analysis consumer producer, which can consume data, either visualize the data using root or store the data in parquet format. And we have a process data spooler, which consumes the built event and visualize it in a root. We also use a Flask backend, which is used to provide configuration data for our data sources. And it can also consume the process data and expose it to view where it can be used for visualization. To monitoring our, for monitoring of our data flow, we use cruise control. Communication for the loss happens through topics or communication between data sources and the backend happens through different topics. Most of our front end data sources will sub subscribe to management topic and a control topic. The management topic is used to send configuration data to the front end electronics. Once the device has been configured, you can send commands from the backend via the control topic to start the run. When a run is started, uh, front end electronics will produce to what we call equipment topics. This will be consumed by a collated event builder 
which will build the interesting event, produce it back into Kafka, into the event topic where it will be consumed by the backend and exposed to view for visualization. We also monitor our front end using feedback topics, which for every, every state change, the front end electronics will produce a message so we know exactly what state the electronics are in. How exactly is our event or interesting events built? We have one or multiple data sources. A data source can be a crate with different modules, electronic modules, used in exper experiment, and this will produce to one or multiple topics. The topics corresponds to the module that's in the, the crate, and data is produced in raw format. The collated event builder will then consume these message, messages sequentially using this algorithm, which is just a fancy way to describe a for loop. We then unpack the data and append them to an event list where we create the JSON message, which will describe the physics event or interesting event, and then produce it back into our cluster where it can be consumed by our backend for visualization. For visualization, we focus mainly on Plotly within Vue.js or Root, because Root is still extensively used at uh, research facilities. Most visualization frameworks are really going to be application dependent. For the reason why we went with Plotly is because it, has a, it is a powerful graphing library it can create interactive plots like histograms and heat maps, heat maps. And for instance, we can create 1D, 2D, even 3D histograms. And Plotly can be used within Jupyter. Here's an example of what we have uh, we've visualized using the loss. This is an example of one single event. I wanted to bring a better plot, but the hardware was unavailable for us. Potential pitfalls we had while developing the system. Under test, we discovered that if the event builder is not start is not started before the data produces start producing data, we will get an event that will only read out one specific module as shown here in this example. The reason why this happens is because the way Kafka fetched partitions, this issue was resolved by we created a consumer object for each module that exists in the experiment. And this was the result we got. We had ADC, TDC, and QDC event readout. And this is basically just an example. A real event would be a bit more populated than this. Even though this is an open source collaboration, uh, we are currently developing in our internal fork. In, we are developing on an internal fork uh, using GitLab, but you can still find the public public repo, which is still available. Uh, we'll show the the link on the next slide. Um, once our development is done in our internal fork, we'll be publishing publishing our non prior IP modules into the public repo where it can be accessed. Concluding remarks at this point would be that in the next two weeks, we're going to uh, release our first version of the software, which is for the KC converted subsystem. There's a total of nine um, experimental facilities, which we're going to be planning on releasing every one to two months. Our biggest risk developing for the system was number one, the big C COVID-19, and also due to supporting and working on other projects. I've also provided links which gives you access to the public to loss repo. Thank you for listening and thank you for your time. And I will take any questions. Yep. Okay. Uh, so I see a question uh, from David. 
basically asking how do we handle security on sending messages um, to control topics. So yeah, I think that's a, an excellent question. Um, so in the current implementation, we, we haven't implemented any security measures yet, but Kafka does provide uh, a number of alternatives uh, from authentication with uh, things like SASL or SSL, uh, as well as access control lists. So we probably thinking we'll start as simple as access control lists. So only clients that are authorized to write to our topics can do so. And so these are this would be clients within our control. But then uh, as the, the application matures, we can look at other authentication mechanisms. I don't know if that answers your question. I see Keswell was also answering the Yeah. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, right. Um, are there, I see people typing. Are there any, give a moment to see if there any further questions. Um, yeah. All right. There's a question from Ian van der Linde about the average latency. Uh, so. Yeah, um, okay, so we haven't really done any benchmarking as yet. Uh, we're still basically in the dev environment. Um, I think Bertram mentioned that we have like a, a nine broker cluster at the moment, just running off some very basic virtual machines. We, we're we looking at uh, different options, one having an on-prem cluster, maybe with well-specced uh, hardware and so forth as well as a cloud option. Uh, but there are some nice benchmarking tests uh, that have been done by others on, uh, on Kafka, just showing general purpose PCs and how uh, the performance is there. So I think that's one of the things we would then do before we, we go to production or to launch. Okay, since we are close to time and I oh there's one more question that's just come up um, and, um, yeah are there any okay, so popular we... frameworks and yes uh, we do use epics uh, that's part of our slow control that we can also aggregate into Kafka with our data acquisition systems yeah uh, we make heavy use of epics uh... Oh, yeah, I haven't heard of Tango controls. Well, maybe that's something worthwhile to look at. Right, okay. in which case, let us thank our speakers. Um, I will be closing this this room in um, a few minutes. Um, the next talk um, will be in a separate um, big blue button room. Details are on the announcement channel on Discord. Um, and we'll start schedule. We will be starting again at half past two. Um, the only other uh, thing that I think I need to announce is that the lightning talks um, slots are now full. So um, if you wanted to submit a lightning talk, um, I'm afraid you are too late, but uh, we do have an awesome set of lightning talks for you to enjoy. And yeah, I think that's about it. So thank you all for attending and thank very much to our speakers. Hey, thank you. Yeah. I can see you on Discord.